Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Wednesday Wisdom. I have a very special guest with me today. She is the creator of Oscar So White and also Rainy Day Jobs. She's the co-founder of Sister Scotus, and she is a Sephora equity advisor. And she's a diversity inclusion advocate and a culture commentator. Please welcome April Rain. April, how are you? I'm well. Thank you for having me on today. Uh, thank you for being with me. Um, I just let's, let's just get into it. Um, what inspired you to create the hashtag Oscar So White? Um, you know, I would love to say that there was a sexy story behind it. You know, I was strategizing and ideating with my team around, you know, a mahogany conference room table, but that wasn't it at all. It was um, complete serendipity. I was still a practicing attorney at that time, uh, January of 2015, and uh, I was watching the Oscar nominations on one of the morning television shows, and I was just an avid moviegoer entertainment consumer. I didn't have any contacts um, with the entertainment industry at all. Uh, and it just struck me as um, Chris Hemsworth, who was one of the presenters that year, read the names of the acting categories. There were no people of color nominated. Um, in 2015, we're talking about the films from 2014, so that was Selma, that was Beyond, Beyond the Lights, so there were definitely um, some great performances that I thought could have been nominated. And so I picked up my phone which is typically embedded in my forearm and said Oscar's so white they asked to touch my hair and that was it um, I went on to work um, with no you know agenda at all I checked in on Twitter around lunchtime and the hashtag based on that one tweet was trending around the world hmm. did you expect to get the reaction that you got from that no, I mean, I was being, you know, snarky and petty as I typically am on Twitter. Um, and so, you know, the pe the responses initially were equally snarky and petty. Um, you know, Oscar So White, they wear Birkenstocks in the wintertime. You know, Oscar So White, they think mayo is a little spicy. Um, so it wasn't until a couple of days later when the conversation shifted to from humor to something more substantial about um, the lack of equity and inclusion of people of color, um, initially with respect to the academy, but now the conversation obviously five years later has broadened to all marginalized and traditionally underrepresented communities within the entertainment industry. So that's Broadway, that's TV, that's film, uh, you, that's music, you name it. All right. Um, as you said, um, that hashtag sparked a huge conversation about diversity in media and entertainment. Um, do you think the exclusion of black people and people of color was deliberate or an unconscious bias through the industry? I think it was both. I, I think that there um, are people who still believe that black films, whatever that means, will not travel well. Uh, you know, despite the fact that we have, you know, Get Out um, and The Black Panther and several other examples, you know, but especially back then, uh, you know, but even still today, some people think, oh, you know, well, it may do domestically uh, relatively well, but it's not going to do well overseas, which isn't true. And so people make casting decisions um, both in front of and behind the camera based on that fallacy. Uh, and I also think that there is a lot of um, unconscious bias within every single industry and, and the entertainment industry is not immune to that. So part of the issue there is um, a lot of the jobs behind the camera, you know, the production jobs, the gaffers, the, you know, the best boys and the key grips and all those things that, you know, go down the screen really quickly during the credits, um, those are union jobs. And so you have to work a certain number of hours or know somebody in the union who can sponsor you to get in. So it's a catch 22, you know, how do you get in to work a certain number of hours so that you can become a union member if nobody sponsors you or you can't get that first job to get your foot in the door and show how good you are. Okay. Um, this conversation is moving out of entertainment into um, a larger conversation in corporate America. How would you define representation, diversity, and inclusion in the corporate structure? How does that fit into that? Well, I, I think it's necessary. I, I think in every industry, including the corporate industry, um, if you are not being intentional with respect to equity and inclusion uh, within your company or organization, corporate, entertainment, or otherwise, you're literally leaving money on the table at this point. Um, you know, what we know, the data shows that diversity, 
sells. The more diverse a project is, the more diverse an offering is, the more diverse a company is, the better it, it does. Um, what we have to be very careful of, especially in the corporate setting, setting is, you know, we've just come out of what some have called the summer of racial reckoning, right? After the deaths of um, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery and others. Uh, and so corporations were quick to, you know, put that black space up on social media and say Black Lives Matter. Um, but then when you look at their C-suite, <laughs> you know, it is a very homogenous group of people, meaning the no people of color, very often, you know, few or no women. Um, and so uh, corporations um, and, and others need to put their money where their mouth is. You know, it can't just be recruitment. It can't, you know, it can't be a revolving door. It also has to be retention. It has to be mentorship. It has to be, you know, about what that pipeline looks like um, to the top, to, you know, the upper echelons of that corporation. So all of those things are really important and um, what's what I found really interesting is that as I have these conversations with corporate entities is those um, CEOs and C-suite executives who tie um, their salaries and their bonuses to diversity initiatives within the company um, really are the ones who are being forward thinking here because they're willing to put their money on the line. You know, I'm going to get less bonus or no bonus if, you know, if the company isn't doing what it should be doing already. Uh, and, and that's interesting to see. There aren't enough of people who are doing that, but, you know, they are out there. Okay, that actually goes into my next question. As you said, you know, there was, a out, there was an outpouring of public support from companies in the wake of George Floyd's death. Um, now that the media attention is sort of passed on from that moment, how can companies be held accountable to ensure their actions match the statements? Well, um, you know, assuming that they, uh, that they are taking actions, I, I think that's up to consumers. You know, we think we undervalue our power, the power of our purse and our wallets. Uh, you know, I think that consumers in the last several years have become much more savvy with respect to who they will um, patronize and who they will not, you know, and again, that's, that's uh, entertainment, that's, but that's also the products that they buy. You know, recently, uh, I, the president or the CEO of Goya Foods went to the White House, you know, and, and was with Trump, and like immediately <laughs> there was backlash, and you know, I'll say I haven't bought a Goya product since, you know, and, and we had Goya in our cabinets, um, you know, because there are alternatives, and I think consumers are realizing that no one is doing the only game in town. There's always a competitor, you know, and sometimes if you have to pay a dollar more, if you have to travel a couple of miles further to get that thing that sits right with your heart, um, it's worth it to do that. So I, I think part of it is up to consumers to say, you know, if you if you are if you are just um, engaged in performative allyship, uh, you know, you're not putting your money where your mouth is, kind of literally, uh, then you know we've got other choices. Okay. Um... Social media is a major driver of a lot of these initiatives and a lot of the change we've seen, at least on the surface in this conversation. Um, another part of social media is that black creators and influencers are the driving force of social media. But we've seen often that the work is often taken by larger corporations and monetized without giving them credit and compensation. How can black creators protect themselves and benefit from what they create? Yeah, it's an ongoing problem. And a lot of it is that we don't know what we don't know. Um, you know, so there are organizations out there like Creative Control and the Institute for Intellectual Property of, of, uh, and Social Justice, IPSJ, uh, who work with creatives to teach them about trademarks and copyrights and patents uh, so that we're not putting all of our treasure out there for easy consumption. Uh, you know, and I always go back to, it's been several years now, but I always go back to Peaches Monroe and the eyebrows on Fleet Girl, right? She made this little viral video uh, and then within six months I mean Bath and Body Works had an on fleek line of products you know there was there's actually a restaurant in New York City called Sports on Fleek uh, and she was not compensated for any of that and she was young you know she I think she may have been like 16 17 years old so she just didn't know the questions to ask she didn't know you know whether she had a copyright or what she needed to do to protect it um, and you know very often with hashtags and, and viral videos you never know know what's going to hit. So, you know, how do you put that genie back in the bottle? You know, it's already trending around the world. And then you're like, oh, wait, I don't want anybody to use it, you know, because I want to be able to capitalize as you should, you know, and, and monetize it. Um, you know, and so 
for some of us, we need to be thoughtful. Uh, you know, I, I used to have these really long, even before we could do threads on Twitter, you know, I used to have these really long conversations about a particular issue. And then one day the light bulb went off and I was like, wait a minute. I can cut and paste exactly what I put on Twitter, you know, into a Google Doc and pitch this item, you know, pitch this the same information, but then get paid for it from a publication. So we just need to be smarter, um, you know, and, and learn more about the process and make sure that we're protecting ourselves. Yeah, I've seen that happen a lot on social media. People will write whole books and just give them up for free and threads and everything. And you look at them, it's like, this could be a great, you know, ebook or something you could monetize with. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and why shouldn't you get paid for it? I mean, you know, it, it, it is your brain capacity that you're putting out there. It's your time. It's your, you know, your thought process. It's your talent. And clearly, you know, you've got people listening. You've got people retweeting. It's worth something to them. So even if it's a dollar or whatever, or, you know, you get $500 or $1,000 from a publication, even better because you are already putting that information out there, but you should obviously get compensated for it. Okay. Um, in this push for diversity and inclusion, there's been a lot of missteps from corporations, um, people who've been maybe meant well or they didn't have the cultural um, knowledge to how to do this properly. How do you feel about like independent black companies like ad agencies and agents uh, partnering with larger companies to try to like ease those, that process along? Yeah, I think it's vital. Uh, you know, cultural competency is necessary. So, you know, and there's so many examples. You know, one of the biggest ones is, is Pepsi a few years ago with one of those Jenner Kardashian gals, you know, who thought she was going to solve racism with a sip of soda or something. And, you know, and, and I'm a marketing major, you know, by trade, you know, an undergrad, that was, that was my major. And so, you know, you have these internal and external conversations, like, well, who was in the room you know, to make those decisions? Were, were there no black people at Pepsi, at that independent ad agency? You know, how many levels of, you know, of commitment were received for this particular ad and nobody said anything. And part of the issue also is not just who is in the room, but who feels that they have power and agency to speak. You know, because if you've got, you know, again, you know, we're talking about diversity. So if it's just sort of um, window dressing, and so you've got a young intern in there who is, you know, from a marginalized community, say, like, oh, okay, we've got one, we can check off that box. But that person doesn't feel um, empowered enough to say, hey, you know, that's a problem. We should probably talk to somebody. Um, you know, then it becomes an issue. You know, it, it, I don't believe in cancel culture, so it's not like Pepsi, you know, I'm sure they didn't lose any market share or what have you, but they did get dragged on social media, and it was an unforced error, right? So they spent millions and millions of dollars, they, they ended up pulling that commercial, um, and it didn't have to be that way. So I think it's it vital that companies, organizations, brands, and so on work with um, ad agencies, publicists, companies, um, who specifically work in that particular field with the demographic that you're trying to reach. You know, it doesn't always have to be black versus white. You know, it's not a binary. But, you know, if you're going to do, I, I just saw recently a commercial um, with a black queer couple, right, who went home for the holidays for the first time or whatever. Well, then have some queer folks in the room when you're making those decisions in your storyboarding. You know, make sure that you've got some disabled folks in the room because, you know, we very often, especially with Oscar so white, it's a binary. Oh, we need more black folks. It's like, no, we need all traditionally underrepresented folks, you know? So why not have a, a visibly disabled person on the set, in the commercial, whatever we're talking about, because they exist too, they deserve representation, um, you know, and, and it's an easy lift um, to ensure that you are, um, you know, being mindful of, again, the demographic that you're attempting to reach. Okay. Um, what will it take to shift the idea of diversity from front facing like actors and spokespeople and branding to decision making, like being the power behind the desk? It, it takes more representation behind the desk, you know, and, and, and we've seen that. Yeah, when people are given the opportunity to make those decisions, they make the right calls. You know, obviously Ava DuVernay with Array um, is the prototype for that, you know, so it, it, and again, it wasn't just about black folks, you know, for Queen Sugar, every single episode of Queen Sugar has a female director slash showrunner every single one. I think they're in five years now. And that gives an enormous amount of confidence and opportunity to women who may not have it otherwise, right? And, 
and so that should be the way it is across the board. Um, I, that's why I find in the entertainment industry, it's encouraging that actors and actresses and others are no longer waiting for the seat at the table. They're creating their own production companies and then they can decide, you know, what films are going to put out, what films are going to support. And very often we see those are more inclusive and representative representative of, um, you know, of, of the American audience. So it's the same way in corporate America. You know, if you have a homogenous group, typically older white men making all of the decisions, um, then you're going to get the same sort of stale um, offerings, you know, again, whether it's a product or a brand or an ad or, or what have you, um, and you're not going to be as relevant as someone, uh, you know, as an organization or a corporation that has a more diverse um, decision-making room, you know, not just smatterings of people throughout the organization, but the decision makers should be as diverse and inclusive as the audience you're trying to reach. All right, um, last question. Um, what do you see as the future of representation, diversity, and inclusion in American entertainment and corporate culture? Oh, um, you know, all of this is, it's always a question of whether it's going to be a moment or a movement. I, I feel like um, so many of us, meaning consumers, uh, have gotten the taste of the good life in, in the sense that, you know, we know how good it can be when given the opportunity that we're not going to go back to the homogenous stuff. You know, the, you know, the same old, you know, we're over, you know, movies about slavery when we can have, you know, something that is, that is much more deep and insightful, you know, or at least told from this perspective of enslaved people as opposed to, you know, typical, you know, which is the, the, viewpoint of the enslaver um you know I, and i i think that social media has become it, it's just so immediate you know and, and we see so many um direct examples of how influential social media can be you know it was just a couple of days ago right where they the county board about board of elections or whatever changed their policy with respect to a political issue you know with respect to whether they're going to certify votes for the 2020 political election uh, so we know that there is power there um, and i think it's going to be the same in the in entertainment industries and with corporate strategy you know you have got to be more nimble than you ever have before you have to be more thoughtful about who is sitting around you you have to ensure that you are saying hey i want to hear what so-and-so has to say on this particular issue when so-and-so is a person from a traditionally underrepresented community um, you cannot you know performative allyship is not going to work because i think consumers can see through that uh, and because we have so many choices those who are reticent to make changes with respect to equity inclusion um, and represent representation regardless of industry um, you know will be left behind all right april rain creator of oscar so white slayer of confederate hbo thank you so much for joining me my pleasure thank you for having me all right thank you